Hi, I'm Mark Horwich from Yale School of Medicine, um, and I'm, I want to describe another little segment of uh, a, sh a chaperonin experiment that we carried out that came at the issue of where proteins might be folded uh, by chaperone and ring structures. Um, and so um, the question is where are, are polypeptides actually folded by these machines? Are they folded inside the machine or are they folded outside in solution after release from them? Um, this was a murky question at one point uh, with the field uh, fairly divided about whether folding could occur uh, inside chaperonins or whether chaperonins simply were used to unfold proteins that had undergone misfolding and then release them back into free solution where they could uh, productively fold uh, potentially. So the people who worked on this problem were Wayne Fenton, Corinne Hull, and Jonathan Weissman as the principals. Uh, and so here is where we uh, sat when we first had an unliganded structure of GROW-EL. Uh, we imposed the uh, native structure of one of our favorite substrate proteins for the chaperone, namely the sulfur transferase called rhodonese, the 33KD uh, protein, uh, upon the uh, unliganded structure of GROW-EL. And what you can see is that there's a pretty terrible steric clash here where the apical domains, uh, sorry, the apical domains of GROW-EL are uh, borne upon by a rhodonese even in its native state. Of course, in a non-native state, we'd expect the protein to be somewhat expanded, so the steric clash with the apical domains would be even worse than what you see here. Uh, and so this suggested that maybe folding could not occur inside the machine, but our thinking about that was rapidly changed by our longtime collaborator, Helen Sable, shown here on one of the few sunny days in London, sitting in her backyard garden uh, reading a book, or Nature, or some other journal. Uh, in any case, what Helen showed from um, uh, single particle reconstructions using cryo-EM or negative stain uh, imaging, with the results being roughly the same in both cases, was that when GROW-ES binds to a GROW-EL ring, and remember, what you just saw was unliganded GROW-EL, when GROW-ES binds, now the apical domains of the bound ring open up and there's a space underneath GROW-ES, shown here, that is fairly considerable, substantially larger than the volume of the cavity of an unliganded GROW-EL ring. Uh, and the uh, presence of that space uh, excited us uh, hugely because suddenly it seemed possible that a polypeptide could actually be fit into that space and maybe folding could even take place in that location. So uh, Jonathan Weissman, who was a postdoc in the lab at that time, carried out um, an order of addition proteolysis experiment. So uh, he used two different orders of addition. As shown at the top here, he added GROW-ES first to GROW-EL, um, uh, followed by polypeptide, and then followed by uh, treatment with uh, the protease uh, protonase K. And so as you can see here, the topology is such that if GROW-ES binds asymmetrically, um, that will more or less encapsulate this ring. Uh, and polypeptide is unable to bind to that ring. It'll rather bind in trans to the opposite ring. And then upon addition of protonase K, will become completely digested. And that is what, in fact, he observed. And the prediction was that if you reverse the order of addition such that polypeptide is added first, then followed by GROW-ES, if GROW-ES comes on randomly, either to the same ring as polypeptide or to the opposite ring of polypeptide, two different results would obtain. When it comes on the same ring, the polypeptide should be protected from proteinase K. When it comes on the opposite ring, polypeptide is really effectively bound in trans and is susceptible then to proteinase K digestion. And indeed, when he carried out this experiment, he observed that roughly 50% of the substrate protein that was put in at the original step over here was protected from proteinase K digestion. And he used several different substrate proteins, uh, including rhodonese, OTC, and, and one or two other proteins. So to confirm, in fact, the topology of um, a, a, a cis topology in particular, namely that a polypeptide could be bound or housed underneath a GROW-ES 
uh, inside of a Groyel ring, he carried out a hit and run crosslinker experiment. So this availed of a very cute uh, photo uh, activatable crosslinker uh, that could be iodinated. Called, uh, the crosslinker is called APDP. I won't read out the whole name, but the point is that the guts of this crosslinker are uh, a salicyl amide group here. So on the ring of the salicyl group, one could iodinate to make this crosslinker hot, and it also has an azido group that is a photoactivatable crosslinker. At the other end of the molecule is essentially, if I can point it out correctly here, is a disulfide that is a, with a, a hook to a pyridyl leaving group uh, that allows one to place this um, uh, crosslinker through a cysteine onto a substrate protein. So for example, rhodonese, one of our favorite substrates, has uh, I believe four cysteines on it. And so you could efficiently put this crosslinker uh, on rhodonese and now bind rhodonese to Groyel. Here the crosslinker is symbolized by this star. And one could then shine light on, the, uh, on this complex. Uh, and that would photo crosslink uh, through the azid group. That ring would now become uh, covalently attached to the uh, proximate Groyel ring that is near the polypeptide chain. And one could then reduce uh, with DTT and the polypeptide would effectively uh, leave such that only the iodinated group is left on the, um, is left on the, um, uh, the Groyel ring that was near to the polypeptide. Okay, so that's the uh, photo crosslinker and the experiment that was essentially employed. Uh, and here is the results of a key order of addition that confirms a cis topology. So once again, the order uh, at the level of the reaction is to add uh, our substrate protein, OTC, or in this experiment, rhodonese, uh, then add GROES, now protonase K to get rid of any uh, polypeptides that's in a trans ring, and now uh, shine light to essentially photo crosslink, uh, and, and then look to see where bands would appear on a gel, on an SDS gel, uh, upon denaturation of these complexes. And so if I can get sufficiently out of the frame of this experiment, here you see these orders of addition. So substrate with the photo crosslinker is added in the first step to the left. Then grow yes is added to either encapsulate in cis or uh, bind in trans. Then protonase K is added, and you can see that the cis localized polypeptide is protected here, but digested here. And then shine light uh, to photo crosslink as shown here. And so now the polypeptide is photo crosslinked in cis. And if it's photo crosslinked to cis in cis, the protease K will have cleaved the tails off of the subunits that are in trans, but won't touch the uh, cis subunits because it's protected by the presence of GROES. And thus one would see essentially an uncut polypeptide. And that is what you see when you come all the way over here and look on the SDS gel, is that most of the material is indeed uncut. It's present in the cis complex. Uh, and so this uh, hit and run cross-linking experiment, um, placing a photo cross-linker that could be um, essentially effectively reduced off of uh, bound rhodonese after photo cross-linking, allowed us to see that um, uh, there a, a, a cis topology was in fact possible. Uh, and so um, in a next step, we asked whether um, cis or trans complexes were capable either, in either case of being productive of the native state of a polypeptide. Uh, and so Wayne Fenton and the group uh, made either trans complexes with OTC or cis complexes. So in the case of trans complexes, he bound GROES first in the presence of ADP, then bound uh, OTC and trans. In the case of cis complexes, he bound uh, OTC first, then added GROES and magnesium ADP to encapsulate, but also uh, to get rid of anything that was bound, any OTC bound in trans, he treated with protonase K. And now he had uh, selective populations of either trans or cis 
uh, OTC complexes. And now uh, he carried out um, a uh, activation of folding using ATP added for only brief periods of time before treatment with a pyrase to digest the ATP. Uh, and I'm going to describe uh, how he did this experiment, in fact, under single turnover conditions that allowed us to establish that, in fact, a folding starts at cis complexes and not at trans ones, that trans complexes are not productive. Uh, it was an interesting argument in the lab. Uh, nobody really had a clear idea what was going to work, but it turns out that cis, um, somewhat to our surprise, uh, turned out to be productive uh, of the native state of OTC. Um, so now I have to back up to de describe the single turnover aspect of this experiment. So it availed of the ability to produce GROEL as a single ring version. And so here you're looking at the interface between uh, the top GROEL ring and the bottom GROEL ring, or one portion of it. So shown here is one subunit uh, on top uh, of, of the top ring of a top ring of GROEL. But it is actually in contact with two adjacent subunits in the bottom ring. Uh, to the left, you see um, a GLU-34 that is from one subunit of the bottom ring, making a sort of uh, nearby contact to GLU-34 from the relevant subunit of the top ring. There's actually a two-fold symmetry axis that would go right into the board at that position. Uh, and also, at the right-hand contact here, there's another uh, sort of two-fold symmetry axis that goes, uh, I don't know if I can point, about right here into the board. Uh, and you see that there is uh, the two-fold arrangement of a, of a series of residues that include ARG-452, GLU-461, BAIL-464, and SEER-463. The bottom line is when all of these residues, these four residues, were simultaneously changed to alanine, now what one saw was a single ring version of GROEL produced in E. coli when that mutant construct was expressed. And so a single ring version of GROEL was of considerable value to us because uh, in, for the experiment that I'm going to describe to you, uh, Wayne's experiment in a little bit more detail, um, the single ring version of GROEL could serve as a GROES trap. That is, it could bind grow, yes, but since it had no opposite ring, it could never release it. Uh, and so in Wayne's experiment, the cis or trans test, what he did was to add SR1 as a trap for grow, yes, magnesium ATP for short periods of time, and then a pyrase. So the reaction starts here or in cis over here, and it can really only go one round because there's a huge excess of the trap GROES is only released once before it's completely trapped by these molecules, and the polypeptide can go where it goes. So as it turns out, the cis complexes are productive and produce the OTC trimer. By contrast, the trans complexes do not produce any OTC enzymatic activity. Probably most of the OTC molecules simply rebind to GROEL and go nowhere. They're just bound. Uh, I doubt whether they're very stable, free in solution. They would probably tend to aggregate under those conditions. But certainly there's no OTC activity produced by a trans uh, complex under these conditions. Okay, so with that in mind, we could say that polypeptide chain folding commences at a cis-ternary complex. The question was, could it go all the way to completion inside of a cis-ternary complex? And for that experiment, once again, we could use this SR1 version of GROEL, this single ring version where we had shaved off the residues with mutations that lie at the equatorial uh, interface and thus pr uh, produce obligatorily a single ring version of GROEL. So Corinne Hull was a visiting uh, student from Duke University one summer, and she and Jonathan uh, carried out this experiment. So basically what they did was to take SR1 add rhodonese to it to form a binary complex of rhodonese and SR1. Uh, after all, the apical domains of the open ring version of SR1 are perfectly capable of binding non-native polypeptide. And now they added ATP and GROES to that complex. And so that formed what is effectively a stable cis-ternary folding chamber 
unable to be ejected because there is no opposite ring with which ATP binding could eject the cis ligands. Uh, and so therefore, uh, they could ask whether rhodonese could go all the way to the native state inside of this 400 kd complex that they had formed. And so on the top panel here is just the total recovery of rhodonese enzymatic activity uh, at this reaction uh, free in solution. Um, so they've just analyzed total rhodonese activity of the re reaction mixture and what they see is that the recovery of rhodonese at SR1 grow ES ATP shown on top here is the same as that at a wild type reaction. Um, and in fact, as evidence that the refolding was occurring inside of this complex, what they did at the various time points in a second experiment was to carry out gel filtration and isolate the 400 kD fraction off the gel filtration column from each of these time points down here and assay for rhodonese, the material that came off the gel, gel filtration column. Uh, column. And what they observed was that they saw the exact kinetics of recovery uh, coming in uh, with the gel filtered material as they observed from looking at the total reaction as shown above. Uh, and so this uh, demonstrated that polypeptide chain folding could go all the way to completion uh, inside of a cisternary uh, folding chamber. So the conclusion is that Productive folding by GROEL occurs in a GROES encapsulated cis folding chamber. And I would just point out that the characteristics of this chamber are um, to be very hydrophilic, in fact, quite electrostatic, a little bit of an excess of negative charge. But we think that all of this charge um, presents essentially a no stick surface that effectively allows the polypeptide chain to pursue its way down the energy landscape to the native state without real interference, almost as if it were at infinite dilution. Um, so our supposition is that the walls of GROEL really don't carry any steric information, even though there are collisions almost certainly of non-native uh, proteins with those walls, but rather provide an encapsulated chamber where aggregation of multiple molecules simply cannot occur and the isolated polypeptide chain uh, has time to try out different conformations and ultimately reach uh, the native conformation at the energetic minimum.